Hey everyone, thank you for attending today. Uh, we're going to get started. We're going to leave the, maybe the door open to have a few more people come in. Um, before we get started, I just want to let you know I'm going to pass out a sign out sheet, a sign up sheet because um, as we're trying to build this program, uh, we would really like your input. And so if you could uh, give us your name and email, we would like to uh, send you out a quick survey so that we can know how to further build this program and make it better for you. Um, so I don't want to take any more time. This morning, Tara Goodale, uh, who's a Montessori training instructor, will be presenting on uh, Montessori math from ages 3 to 9. Um, and she's currently serving as a curriculum consultant for the school. So thank you, Tara. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here to talk about probably one of my favorite pieces of the Montessori method, which is math. Um, but first, I'd really like to thank Sarah and Rhonda for putting together these curriculum spotlights. I think it's really easy to get very focused on what our children are doing today, this week, and it's really nice to have the opportunity to stand back and reflect a little bit and um, zone in on something, especially something that starts when a child is so young and continues them on all the way up into uh, upper elementary which is really um, something that's so magical about what Maria Montessori developed in her methods. She, as many of you probably know, was a scientist and a doctor, and she was incredibly innovative during her time, especially. And she thought that why not take these things that children see right when they're born, color, shape, size, these things that they're experiencing with their senses, and translate it into a way for them to understand really abstract concepts. And she did this throughout the curriculum, in history, she developed timelines. One of my favorite lessons in history is the long black strip, which is this 20 meter long timeline that's all black that represents the history of the earth. And at the very end, there is a small little white strip that represents how long humans have been on earth. And just that idea of how this black represent, represents um, Earth's life, but yet here we are at the very end. Such a simple way to really show children these big ideas. Um, so a quote that she said was, the senses being the explorers of the world open the way to knowledge. And certainly that's what she developed throughout her curriculum, and today we're going to focus in on actually only part of the math curriculum. We're going to look at this particular scheme that she developed, which was, again, very simple. Green, blue, and red. Three simple colors that she defined in place value, starting when a child is very young, going all the way up through upper elementary. So we're going to start taking a little journey as a child. So at three, a child comes into a children's house classroom exploring lots of things. And one of the major things that they're exploring is something that's called sensorial. I don't have any examples of those today, but many of you may have seen them if you've been in a children's house classroom. Sensorial materials are things like the pink tower, the brown stair. Children are building with shapes exploring color and pattern. And then as they get a bit older and they're ready to really understand numbers and the fact that numbers have a value. And one of the first ways that they're gonna see that is in this color scheme. Now again, this is very small. And I do have to say that so many of these materials are designed for a child to see up close. So forgive me if you're in the back and can't quite see it well enough. You can just let me know and I'll bring it over. Um, this color scheme is again something that's consistent all throughout the curriculum and it's the numbers one through nine. Um, one starts as red, two is green, three is blue, etc. So the children are exploring these and after a while they really get to know those colors. As a six to nine teacher working in some of the other materials you can say a four and the child immediately grabs yellow. I mean, they, these colors are really, you know, ingrained in their understanding. Um, but this is the first, one of the first things that they start to learn about. Then, as they get a bit older and they're starting to think about numbers being larger, that's when the golden beads are introduced. The golden beads are just that, beads that are golden. 
and a unit is one golden bead. And then the child begins to understand that when you put 10 together, it becomes a bar. Then when you put 10 of these together, it becomes a square. And here you see you're actually holding 100 beads. The child is seeing that in their hands. So then when you put 10 of these together, you get a thousand cube. And again, there are actually 1,000 beads in this cube. Um, and again, they get to touch it, explore it, understand that this is 1,000. Then they start to build even larger. This is called the 45 layout. And the children lay out units, tens, hundreds, thousands, and again, they see here when you have 8,000, that's actually 8,000 unit beads. So already they're getting this visual idea, and this is happening around the age of five or so, five to six. They're getting a visual idea of what actually 8,000 looks like. It's not just an eight followed by three zeros. It actually has real meaning. And again, I'm introducing this very quickly, but this particular material, and any children's house teacher will tell you, they use it over and over and over again. The cards can be picked up and can be layered on top of one another. So 3,000, 200, 24. And so they're layering. So again, it's not just a 3, 2, 2, 4. There are zeros underneath so that it has real value. So the child can really picture what this looks like. And in fact, if I was with a student right now, I would ask them to please go get 3,224. And they would go physically with the tray and gather that value. So they're really starting to see that and visualize it in their mind. It's a really complete understanding of what numbers are and how they go together. So once that's achieved, um, students are starting to now think about, well, how do numbers relate to each other? How can we add numbers together? How can we subtract one from another? And that is actually also started with the um, golden bead material. I mean, there's so many games and fun ways that children can work together individually or in groups. One child might get this number, another child might get another number. They put them together, add them up, see how much they have. And um, again, really fun way to explore numbers. So now we're starting to get into the lower elementary classroom. The golden beads are a bridge material. So you see this material in a children's house class. You'll also walk in and see it in a lower elementary classroom. But in lower elementary, all of a sudden, there is an explosion of opportunities for them once they understand this. So the materials I brought out today are the stamp game, which is here, the small bead frame and the large bead frame, the checkerboard, and the test tube division. And I think just if you look at them as an overview, you already see, I mean, what sticks out at you? What do you see right away when you look at these materials? Do you see numbers? The colors, right away, that, there they are. The colors are consistent as you go through the material. So I'm going to give a quick overview of every one, but I also would like to point out, again, I have sort of this Montessori guilt because these materials are really supposed to be explored. Oftentimes, the stamp game, for instance, children will use this off and on for months, even more than a year, and they, have, they accomplish a really deep understanding. Today, I'm just giving you a really quick snapshot of that. So the stamp game is a material, and um, Marie Montessori named it stamp game because originally, when she made this, it was out of old postage stamps that she color coded and put in a box. And you'll notice that it's the units, tens, hundreds, and thousands. But now the tens are becoming one thing. Before in the golden beads, they were actually tens. Now the child is understanding because they've had all this. They really understand that if they hold one of these, it represents 10 of the units. 
So I'm going to do an addition problem. The stamp game, you can do all four operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Um, so for an addition problem, I've written one out here. Again, you see the color coding. And the child is going to lay out the two add-ends, which I've done already to save time. It's kind of like a cooking show. <laughs> Um, and so starting with the units, I have seven units laid out and then four. Now when I put them together, the child will count up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I've gotten to ten. So because I've gotten to ten, I know that I need to exchange. Now, this is mimicking exactly probably how all of us learn to do addition. We carry the one. This is becoming the extra 10. But now it makes sense because actually you're not just carrying the one, you're, you're exchanging 10 units for one 10. So now I'm going to count up my tens place. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Once again, I've gotten to 10. So I'm going to exchange 10 tens for one, Hundred. <laughs> and again, carrying a one, but there's deeper meaning than just carrying a one over. Okay, now I have a four and a six plus the one I carried over. And get to ten again. This time it's ten hundreds. all together, the two and the three and the one I carried over, and I can see very clearly my final answer, which is 6,111. And then that would be recorded inside of the student's notebook or however they're recording. Right, any questions about the standard? That was really clear. I'm just gonna keep going. Okay. So now we have um, the small bead frame which is another way um, to investigate, again, the same patterns of math. <laughs> Except the small bead frame, you can add, subtract, and multiply. You cannot divide on the small bead frame. And the children are really motivated by that because they know that at this point, when they start to divide, they're going to get to the test tubes, which is what they're going to get. So, so the, the, this is the math, math game you said, the bottom one here, and the stamp game, that's basically addition in place value? It's definitely place value, yeah. but actually you can do all four operations okay. with the golden beads and the stamp game. I just showed you addition, okay. but actually you can do um, division with a um, multi-digit divisor with the stamp game. Even. Like you could do um, 365 divided by 24 with this. Okay. Um, and I can show you that after if you're interested. Yeah. But yeah, this can be, you can actually do all four operations. But typically, yes, that's how they're going to start, certainly with addition with this, with these two things. So with the small bead frame, <laughs> I've already set up my problem here, but you see now the same thing. Each place value is represented by color, um, and each, it, it's only, again, one bead like that with one stamp. And for this, I'm going to do um, a subtraction problem. And in order to do that, I would put my top number over to the side. So my top number is 6,953. The thousand is on the bottom here. 6,953. I'm going to begin to subtract. There's nothing in the units place, so I don't need to move everything, anything over. Um, I'm taking away three in the tens. I'm taking away four in the hundreds. And then I'm able to read my answer. 3,623. Okay. And actually, as I was doing that, it reminded me of the quote that I wrote up on the board. Um, as a side note, which is, do not tell them how to do it, and do not say a word. If you tell them, they will watch your lips move. 
if you show them, they will want to do it themselves. And as I'm showing this to you, it's reminding me I'm speaking a lot, but if you can picture when a child is working with this, they are, their eyes are on the material to see how it is all working. And that is stimulating creative thought, thinking about how things go together, how things work, without the teacher telling you, this is how you do it. So I'm going to move on to the large bead frame. Oh, but before I do that, at some point through the child's experience in math, they're going to start to even go past the thousands place. And that's when they're going to understand that numbers go up into infinity. But a way we show them some bigger numbers is through this material here, which I'm not going to lay it out completely, but um, again, you see the colors, green, blue, and red. And for this, a unit is represented by this very small unit cube. And when you put 10 units together, you will get this blue 10 bar. When you put 10 of those together, you will get this red 100 square. When you put 10 of them together, you will get this green 1,000. Now, though, we're going to keep going this time. If I put 10 of these together, I will get this 10,000 bar. This is a big wow. <laughs> if I put 10 of those together, I will get this, I'm a little crowded so I can't take it out, this 100,000 square. Another big wow. Now, if I was doing this with the children, this would be hidden. They wouldn't see it yet. And if I put, imagine, if I put 10, 100,000 squares together, I will get 1 million cube. So there are 1 million of these cubes inside of that 1 million cube. So again, it is actually there. That idea of size and color is there. Even when the children are getting older and understanding bigger numbers, there it is, the million cube. You can take that on. Use your mind to think about what a 10 million bar would look like. Use your mind to think about what a 100 million square would look like, and so on. So again, really understanding the idea of, of value in numbers. So now I'm going to go back to the large bead frame because we go up to the millions there. So here in the large bead frame, we now have this idea of the simple family, which is green, blue, red, 10, I mean, unit 10, 100. Then you have the thousand family, which is thousand, 10,000, 100,000. And then you have the unit, the first member of the million family here. And you see that actually becomes white, gray, and black. So it's really separated out for the child. So again, with the large bead frame, we can do addition, subtraction, and multiplication. And I'm going to do a multiplication problem for you. So if we have 13,465, and I started to do it, but I'm going to start from the beginning. I get another thing is the senses with these materials. If you hear that, it's just, it just draws the children in. OK, so five taken once. Five taken twice, I need to exchange. Five taken three times. Again, for us, we know in our mind, okay, we carried that one, <coughs> but we, how we got there was through exchanging. Now I'm going three, four, six, three times. Three taken once, three taken twice. Three taken three times. Need to exchange. Three taken four times. Three taken five times. Three taken six times. And I will keep going. I'm looking at the clock. I'm going to keep going on. But again, if you want to see me afterwards to get more details of this, please. 1,464. This is our multiplicand and multiplying times
times 23. So we're setting up a grid here. We're going to start by doing our first partial product, which is laying out four three times. I've laid out six three times in this square. I've laid out again four three times in this square and one three times in that square. But actually, that's really not what I'm doing because this is representing 60, this is representing 40, and this is representing 1,000. So the other thing is, is now you start to see the beads that have been used. And if you're not familiar with the beads, what I'm gonna do next is a little tricky, but just know that the children know the colors of the beads and the values of the beads really quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and take four three times, and that is <laughs> so, 12 is represented by 2 in the units and 1 carrying over into the tens place. Now I have 6 3 times, which is 18, <coughs> plus the 1 I carried over is 19, so I'm putting the 1 over. 13. Now I am left with four units here. I can exchange that out. So now I have finished my first partial product, which is 4,392. I may write that down or I may not write that down on the paper depending on where the child is. And now I'm going to do my second partial product, which is four taken two times. That's eight. Six taken two times. That's twelve. Four taken two times plus one is nine. And then okay, so I have both of my partial products. But these two answers really want to come together, and they're going to do that with the Montessori slide. They're going to slide down together. The tens would like to be together. The hundreds would like to be together. The thousands and the ten thousands. I'm going to go ahead and add those up. You might think in your mind when you learned how to do multi-digit multiplication, you multiply first by the units, then by the tens, put the zero there and then add them all up. That's what we're doing, essentially. But this is showing us why we're doing that, which is the big difference. Okay, so we have a nine and an eight, which is 17. Okay, and then we have two and a five, which is six. Rusty on the colors. Okay. So again, really quick overview of the checkerboard. This is something that the child would be exploring for a long time. So now we're going to move on to the test tubes. Okay. So this is something that, as a child is in lower elementary, they're waiting for this moment. When do I get to learn the test tube? So, because if you look at it, it is such a, it's an appealing material. It's all these little tubes, little beads in them. And the tubes each have 10 beads inside each one. They are set up again using our color coding. Um, the green inside of the white represents the simple family, which is the units, tens, and the hundreds. Then you have the um, beads that are inside the gray, which is the thousands family. And then you have the first unit of the millions family that's in a black container. Okay. So to set up our problem, we're going to use this board. And I apologize if not all of you can see it closely. But this board here is how we're going to set up our problem. And our problem today is 18,678 
divided by six. So this is a place where you would really take story and integrate it into, into math. Um, there are some children that really like money, so using money is always something that can draw them in. You have $18,678, and you and five of your friends want to split that up. And you're like, oh, I have to split it, but yes, you do. <laughs> and so here we have these, they can be called Skittles, but sometimes we can call them people. These people are standing around, and they are waiting for their share and their share has to be even. Everybody has to get the same amount. So here is our dividend, and I've, again, done it already, but I've placed it inside of these cups. So here's one 10,000. I have 8,000 beads in here, 600 beads, seven tens, and eight units. So, Division is the only time that we start with the largest place value. Because that makes sense. If you're splitting something up, you are going to start with the largest thing. Everybody wants the largest thing first. So everybody's looking at this one 10,000 bead. There are six of them standing around. Is it going to be fair if one person gets it? No, it's not going to be fair. The other five are going to be upset if only one gets the 10,000 bead. So what can I do? with this 10,000 bead. Does anybody have an idea? Say that again, Heather. Break it up. <laughs> break it up, right. So we're going to break it up into 10 pieces, and we're going to exchange. So I'm going to go to my handy dandy center here where I can exchange. I'm going to just make sure there's 10 in here. Two, four, six, eight, ten. I can pour my 10 into my thousands place. And that means nobody is going to get a 10,000. Okay, we had to split it up. So now I have 18,000. Okay, and I can split it up evenly. Everybody has gotten three thousands. Okay, everybody's happy, it's even, we don't need to do anything else. So, if I was recording my answer down, I would put my three here. So now we can clean up. I have to vacuum this angle. Vacuum at this angle. <laughs> there are some really fun ways to do <coughs> You would exchange the ones that are left over. Okay. So for example, if I had passed these out, then let's say instead of 18, I only had 16, then there would have been, it would have been uneven. I would have taken all four of those extra and exchanged them out for four of these tubes. To how much practice we get with our pincer grip doing this too. It's also another added benefit. Okay, so now I'm going to move over into my hundreds. I have six. Seven tens. I'll be able to predict what's 
happening. And you actually hear that with the children too as they're doing this, oh, there's gonna be one left over. You know, they're starting to make connections and able to visualize what's happening before they are even doing it, once they work with this material a lot. Okay, so now here we have a situation where everybody has one, but I have one left over. So what will I do with that one that's left over? Exchange it for 10, 10, for 10 units. or our quotient is 3,113. If we did have any leftovers in the units, that becomes our remainder. And the child will learn to write the R and just write the extra amount down. Okay. So now we're going to bridge into the next level, which is upper elementary. So the really cool thing about these colors is that they continue on even into the decimals. So the decimals, are also color coded. So here we have our friendly unit all the way up into our millions. But now we are starting to break down whole numbers into tenths. Um, and the colors remain consistent. Tenths is still blue, but it actually becomes a lighter blue to represent that the numbers are fading away. Hundredths are still red, but again, it becomes lighter and lighter as numbers become smaller and smaller. This is the decimal board. The students can add, subtract, and I believe multiply with the decimal board. And they also will use these cards. Again, much like way back when, when they were maybe five or so, they used the cards to build numbers. Now they're using the cards to build decimal numbers and laying them out with these squares. Um, I also pulled out the decimal checkerboard, which I have to admit, not being an upper elementary teacher, I haven't worked with a lot, but it's incredible the way that it's set up here in that now you have, your, you have a central unit and whole numbers are getting bigger and decimal numbers are getting smaller and fading away. And in order to do multiplication here, this is an example of 30, um, I'm sorry, it is 32 hundredths times 47 and it would be the same thing. They would slide down to create your answer. Just like in the regular checkerboard like that and then we would exchange them up for our answer there so again something else really cool that when children start to begin to think more and more abstractly there's still always a visual way for them to do that so they're never just going to be told okay this is how you multiply decimals there's always a way and a, and, and a visual way to come in and explain it to them so you can see how it is consistent all the way through hope that gave you a good overview of um, some of the materials in this color coding. And now I think we can take questions if there are any, or if there's any other demos you'd like to see. Jim? So I've seen children doing these exercises alone, and I've seen them doing them in groups. Yes. Can you share what they get on each? Sure, right. When a child is working with um, these materials alone, there's a few things that are happening. One is they're really 
learning focus. Aside from, of course, learning the math materials, but when the child is engaged with their work, they're concentrating, they're thinking, they're really learning about focus and um, just understanding how to, how to be a good thinker. And you see that probably when you see a child working alone, they're counting, they're putting things together. Children, especially in the six to nine and nine to 12, um, we can't always expect that of them. They are social beings, they wanna talk, they wanna understand things together. They also wanna help each other. You know, one child might be you know, an expert at the checkerboard and can work with another child in a way that maybe a teacher didn't think of. Um, so they could both tackle that problem and work together to lay out the beads and come up with it together. And that's just as valuable as, as working alone, especially in the elementary years, where they really, really can learn from each other and feed off each other. So, yeah. I'm just curious how any of these introduced the concept that I find some kids, especially at, at the elementary, the concept of zero and one in multiplication, does this translate? You mean if you multiply something times zero, it's zero? Yeah. And Yes, because if I did anything, any one of these problems on any of these materials, like the same game, for instance, um, you know, you could say to a child, it almost would be like a trick. It would actually right. be a fun thing to do. Can you play, please lay out 234 zero times on your mat? You know, and they would be like, hmm. <laughs> okay, so what would my answer be? Zero. Great. Right, yeah, so that is easily illustrated with these materials. Ah, I'm glad you brought that up. So the chains are related to this, the numerals one through nine. And actually, Diana Norma in her spotlight, which I believe is not the next one, but the next month. Okay, she is going to be going deeply into this sequence because there actually are several more math materials that reflect these patterns, and the chains are one of them. Um, and the chains actually mimic squaring and cubing. So not only are the children learning to skip counts, everybody know what the chains are? See them in the cabinets? When they lay them out, they're skip counting, but they're also learning that three threes is three squared, three times three times three is three cubed, and they're learning that too. And that goes all the way into upper elementary um, and middle school as well. So I know like in the school they learn with all these numbers and all these materials. So how about like, when the child is in a elementary school and somebody asks them or like how, what is two two is to four, how do they do multiplication and additions when they don't have those materials around them? That's a really good question. Our goal is to let these materials teach them how to do it on paper. And that's usually what we refer to it as, is doing it on paper. And children do it in different ways, but many times as a classroom teacher, as you're sitting with a child doing the stamp game, they'll look at you and they'll say, I can just write this down, you know, myself. Can I, do I have to lay it out? I say, well, well, no. Once the material has taught them how to do it, so they now know how to write it down. So our goal is to get them there. You know, the material is what is teaching them. So if they go to, you know, another school, whenever that may be, they're still going to know how to do it. They just learn how to get there in a different way. Does that make sense? Uh, what is the pink tower that everyone talks about? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the pink tower is actually, um, again, it's something that the student works with very early when they're young. And, but um, Maria Montessori designed it specifically with cubes because knowing they would eventually be getting off of this great map. But it's, um, it's a tower of pink cubes. Okay. And Maggie, do you have any thoughts on the pink tower? Well, at first it's just an exercise in building the tower. And that alone takes a lot of their energy because they'll first try to put larger cubes on top of smaller ones and find that that doesn't work. It'll fall over because gravity takes over, so there's like a science lesson. Um, and it's a graduated thing when eventually their eye and their hand coordination comes together and they say, oh, 
it, it, you almost see the light bulb go off and then all of a sudden you see the pink tower and they've mastered it. And then they start to really explore. They pull it apart and they might do it on the ground from the largest cube to the smallest cube. They might put it in a spiral pattern. Uh, they come up with all different creative ideas on how to use that material. And then they'll bring in the brown stair, which is showing the width of different materials. And that's graduated too from, from it's, and it's, it, it's hard to do it without showing it to you, but it, it also um, is the same thicknesses as the cubes. It's just elongated into prisms. And then they learn how to build with that. So it's almost setting a, a basic math mm -hmm. strategy for them without them even knowing it. It becomes more intuitive. And then when they start seeing this, it comes, and you'll, you'll hear kids who stay through. They'll get to sixth grade and they'll say, oh my gosh, I, that, that binomial cube, I get it now. Mm -hmm. you know, if, or in high school, even my own children had revelations about that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it doesn't look fantastic on its own and unto itself and when you see the children manipulating it, but the way that it's drawn right through the whole pedagogy as you go, it's, it's just amazing. It really is. So it's just not building. There's a lot more to it for the children. It's just the groundwork. Well, thank you very much for coming. And thank you.